Welcome back. Uh, this is the third clip of the fifth chapter about the war for talent. And in this knowledge clip, I will talk about psychological theories of attraction and retention. So what I'm going to talk about after this clip, you will understand mental processes that are related to an individual's talent, attraction and retention. I will talk about fairness, I will talk about expectancy theory, and I will talk about psychological contract theory. But before I move on, a little word on how these theories are different from the economic theories that we discussed in the previous clip. Psychology is interested in the evaluation that people make of their, in this case, work environment, what that does to their emotions and how that affects their behavior. In the War for Talent, we are interested in people's motivation to work with a company, so their attraction, uh, but also their, uh, be, their motivation to stay working in, in a job, so to acquire and to keep the best talent. And you can imagine that these mental processes, they include much more than just an evaluation of wages. So in a way, psychology is going to add a la layer of complexity for the things that human resource management can do to attract and keep employees to the organization. In a way, economists make, make life simple. If wages are the thing that you can manage, that's the easiest thing. And psychology, in a way, makes it more complex. But as you will see, it's very important to understand the psychology side of motivation, attraction and retention as well. So let's start with the core concepts of this psychological perspective of attraction and retention. And the idea here is that in the eyes of employees, when their rewards and their work is fair, if the organization pays a so-called fair price, and we'll discuss later what this price and exactly entails, then they are uh, willing to keep working in this organization. So fairness is the outcome of... Uh, an evaluation and it's often uh, exchanged with the word justice. Well, there are hardly any difference between those words, but if you want to make a difference, then justice is more the evaluation of the conditions for the outcome and then fairness is the reaction to the evaluation itself. So you can be dissatisfied about your salary, for example, um, and uh, the process of how you come to this the satisfaction would be the justice, so you feel that it's not the right amount of salary, and the, the dissatisfaction itself about it is then the fairness reaction. Core words in this theory of fairness uh, are the words uh, evaluation and reaction. So it's all about perceptions of employees, their emotions, so how, do, how does it make you feel, uh, and how does that lead into behavior. Um, so like I said, this is the domain of psychological theories. It's going inside the minds of, of, uh, of people in general and try to understand what happens there. Um, and it's oftentimes used to understand voluntary turnover. And as we discussed in the first clip that goes with this chapter, the voluntary turnover is costly. Those are people that you don't want to let go as an organization, the people that you want to keep. Um, so how can you prevent this, um, this behavior that we don't want to see? I'm going to talk about two fairness theories. I start with Adams, that's the oldest one, and I'll build on that continuing with justice the organization justice theory, uh, which was developed in the 1970s. So first to the oldest known theory, theory in our modern age uh, about fairness. Adam's equity theory says that um, there is a need for a balance between what people put into some task and what they get into return. So for employees, there should be a fair balance between how much time they invest in their job, how much effort, how much knowledge, and the outputs that, uh, that they get from that. So the amount of salary, but also a recognition by their supervisor. So many different things can count as outputs in this balance. What employees do in order to evaluate whether their uh, outcomes are fair is compare. 
So they compare either with uh, colleagues or with friends or with general norms that exist in society that are considered as fair outcomes if you have such kind of inputs. Adam's reasons, once there is a perce perceived disbalance, people feel deprived. They are taken away from what they are entitled to according to these comparison norms. So deprivation is the belief that you do not get what you are entitled to, given your conditions, right? So for different types of jobs, there are different outcomes. That's perfectly acceptable. Only if there is a disbalance, then you feel deprived. Um, deprivation leads to negative emotions. And ne negative emotions, people don't like those, so they want to, uh, to get rid of that and to want to restore the balance in order to feel better. So what can employees do in order to restore the balance? There's a choice of, re a choice of reactions that all happen. Uh, so first and foremost, you can decide to maybe reconsider the comparison. So I think it's not fair that what I get from this organization for what I do, but if I look at colleagues in the same department, everybody is in the same position, and that my friend makes a bit more, maybe he or she has more work experience, who can tell? So you can mentally change your perception and then make your situation uh, acceptable again. So nothing much happens. You can get away from the negative emotions by choosing a different comparison. Organizations are not really bothered with this psychological process. It becomes interesting for organizations when people actively start, try to restore the balance by changing their input. So this can either mean um, employees deciding that if they are not receiving the output they hoped, that they will just do a little bit less. So their motivation is slacking. Or in the context of the war for talent, they will look for another place where they can actually do receive the outputs that they were hoping for. So changing your input or change your perceptions. So a little bit more information about changing inputs. What can, you, what can employees do to restore the perceived inequity between what they put into the job and what the organization gives in return? So like I said, changing perception is one thing. Choose another comparison. Um, or change the input. And an important word here is withdrawal. Withdrawal is doing a step back. And doing a step back, you can do that mentally. And mentally means that you feel less engaged in your job, that you feel less connected to what you're actually doing. You're, you're doing a step back. And this will affect the behavior at work. You will be less inclined to help out a colleague, to stay late, you feel less committed to the organization. So if, when you are at a birthday party, you will not spontaneously say how great this organization is. So there is a mental, you're taking a mental distance from, from work. You have cognitive withdrawal. Behavioral withdrawal is actually taking a literal physical step away from work, which means, like I said, you're uh, you work less hard, but also, for example, if you don't feel well, you report in sick a little bit easier. Um, you, don't, uh, uh, you don't take up this extra project, and ultimately, you may actually decide to leave. And this quitting behavior, like I said, in this war for talent, is really the behavior that an organization would like to prevent. So... This idea between uh, the imbalance between what you bring to a job and what the organization gives into return and if this fair or not, um, it's led a lot of researchers thinking to what conditions do people actually accept an outcome that is maybe slightly unjust. Um, so building on the work of Adams, uh, Thibaut and Walker and Leventhal in the 1970s and the 1980s, um, they continued doing research on this equity, this imbalance, um, but they said there are conditions where people can just accept that they earn, for example, less than their colleague and still be happy. Well, what do you think of that? They recognize that, first and foremost, um, distributive justice is important. 
So people must have this feeling of equity that what they receive in terms of outcomes is fair as compared to, uh, uh, yeah, to the norms or those things. Um, and like I said, this can include wages, but it can also be promotion decisions or who, who gets a nice project and all these things. So anything that is distributed among employees can lead to a feeling of injustice uh, and hurt fair, fairness feelings. However, organizations can justify a unequal distribution of outcomes among em employees, and employees can be happy with that. And it has to do with two important conditions. First, if an organization says that it has procedures, and these procedures are acceptable, for making differences between employees, then employees can be happy that there are differences, for example, in rewards. So, for example, imagine that an organization has a merit system um, uh, using objective criteria to determine how much salary each employee is um, worth. Um, and these, you know, these are fair uh, procedures, then employees can be happy that some, em that some employees stand out and earn a bit more than others. So this is procedural justice. So the outcome is different, but they are still happy with the outcome because there are procedures that justify a difference in outcomes. Another important condition for accepting uh, a skewed distribution or a, a potentially unfair distribution is to do with how it is uh, communicated to employees. So how are all the employees taken on board um, and, you know, involved in this decision-making process about, uh, about the distribution? A good relationship with your supervisor who is able to explain why this employee at this point has this project and you not, you don't. Um, this really helps to make the outcome acceptable for employees. There's a lot of research that uh, confirms these three dimensions of organizational justice. So distributive, procedural and interactional justice. Um, there is a little bit of debate that there is maybe a fourth dimension to organizational justice, and you see it in light blue here, and that is informational justice. Um, that is that idea that uh, once you have all the information about a decision, then you will be more happy with, uh, with the outcome. Other researchers say that it's not really um, distinguishable between interactional and informational uh, justice because oftentimes this information is shared in uh, interaction with your supervisors, for example. So important to remember these are the first three dimensions of uh, organizational justice and all of these have effects for the war for talent, as I will show you in the next slide. So turning to research, uh, findings from two large media analysis on the effects of organizational justice on outcomes that matter for organizations. So starting with equity theory, the discrepancy is research between uh, the expected pay, the employees expecting a certain salary, and what they really deserved, or what they really had in their pay slip eventually. Um, and once employees see that there's a discrepancy, so basically when their salary is lower than what they expected, this indeed has a uh, result for how satisfied they are about their salary. And taking together all this, uh, this research in this area, there is indeed a small positive effect of salary dissatisfaction with the intention to leave, with uh, employee sick leave, and with uh, thoughts of leaving your organization, so voluntary turnover. Um, so this indicates that basically the equity and also distributive justice of, of salaries eh, really matters for uh, behaviors to keep employees in the organization and to keep them motivated. Another large media analysis looked into the distinction between distributive and procedural justice, so which of those is actually the most important? Well, it was found that of all the different types of organizational justice, these two are equally important. So if you, as an organization, manage that your employees perceive 
distributive justice as well as procedural justice, you will have a workforce that is, on average, more motivated or more satisfied, more committed, more inclined to stay in the organization. And as we know from social exchange theory, you also get this, uh, uh, in return, positive behaviors like the willingness to do something extra um, and also employees in general feel better. So there's good reason to uh, do research about the perceived fairness of employees in organizations. Moving on to uh, another theory that really influenced how, um, how you can use benefits for employees to motivate them and to keep them in the organization is the expectancy theory by Victor of Rome. So another oldie, um, intriguing one. Um, what Victor of Rome did in, in, uh, in comparison to the, to the fairness and justice theories that we just, just discussed, he, is, he really zoomed into what type of outcomes matter to people. Uh, so he's in, um, uh, in congruence with the previous theory when it comes to the first assumption of the theory. So the motivation to perform really depends on the expected returns for effort. So there's this balance idea. So if I put in something and when I get uh, um, a balanced return, then I'll be motivated. However, Rome noticed that not all people are motivated for the same things. That makes complete sense. Some people are there to build a big career. Others are there to just meet people at work and to have something to do. Some people are there because they value the location where the work is. Some people are there for, name it. People have very different, value very different returns. Um, and to motivate people, you need to understand what's in it for them. So what is the preferred outcome for each individual employee? Because the balance between inputs and outputs depends on the output that is liked by the employee. Victor Frome in the 1960s, uh, psychology was trying to, uh, to make a, a huge statement that it was really also about uh, calculations and formulas. So he tried to, f to uh, combine this in one formula. Um, it's, you can see it in the bottom of the slide and it states that the motivation to, desi to reach a desired outcome, so your effort to actually wanting to do something, um, is the expectancy, the instrumentality, and the valence. I'm going to uh, dive into these three words on the next slides. So remember expectancy, instrumentality, and valence. You see the formula again. Um, the dependent variable, so to speak, is the motivation to perform. So are employees going to put effort in their tasks? Well, that depends. First, it depends on the value that they place in the, uh, in the outcome. So how important is the return that the organization is offering for this employee? If the, re if the output that they are expected to, re to receive is not the thing that they hoped for, that will immediately lower the motivation. However, if there is a valuable outcome to be expected, then the motivation will increase. However, it also depends whether the, there is a clear connection between what employees perform in their jobs and the outcome. So is, the, is there actually a chance that I will receive this valuable outcome when I put enough effort in this job? I will give you a small example. Um, to stay close by, so in universities, uh, many researchers hope to grow in the, in the ranks of the, of the university. So uh, career steps is uh, a very important outcome for many employees. What happens in many organizations, and universities are no different, is that there is a pyramid. So there are very few positions of professors in the top ranks, and there are slightly more, but still not so many as associate professors, and then there are a little bit more, but also, you know, a scarcity as well as uh, assistant professor. And then there's quite a lot of students and uh, PhD students who are aspiring to climb these ranks. 
in practice it's quite difficult to move through the ranks and it's also uh, not always clear that the best performer automatically moves to the next rank. There's also competition among uh, uh, academics in this case and there's also um, policies change. Uh, so there is not always a clear link between your effort as an individual research, researcher in this case and the op the chances to really obtain the next step in the career ladder. So if there is lesser instrumentality, so a less clear link between efforts and outcome, the motivation to perform will reduce. So what happens a lot in uh, universities is that talents get frustrated at some point and they seek their luck outside of academia. So for example, they go work in government or in a large company where they will also make more money, the, as an example. So finally, uh, so instrumentality is about the procedures. Is it, uh, is it clear that there's, that there's a link? And then expectancy has to do with, am I able to reach to, uh, to fulfill this effort to really perform at this level that is needed to receive the outcome that I want. And if you feel at some point that uh, I can't do this again, this will be uh, a reason to drop out of the motivation and maybe look for another job. There is a lot of research to each of these dimensions. Uh, a big disclaimer that I have to tell you here is that the formula is never confirmed. So it is not a multipl multiplication of, of these three things. In reality, these are all separate uh, conditions that lead employees to evaluate whether or not they are going to stay in this job. So there's a lot of value in the theory, but not in the formula. What the, the theory did bring was the awareness that people value different things. And that has consequences, of course, for human resource management. So what are the lessons that we can uh, take from expectancy theory if it comes to managing employees? So first and foremost, communication is key. Uh, make clear what the goals are, make, them, uh, make sure that these are attainable. So it's just putting a high level uh, goal is not motivating. So attainable goals are more motivating than unrealistic goals. Keep your promises. If you say that there's a connection between A and B, so between effort and outcomes, make sure that it, w that it is there. Um, and communicate about the goals and the rewards. Finally, uh, be aware of differences in perception. I think that's the key lesson of uh, Fromm's theory. Not all employees are motivated by the same thing, and they can be perceived also in a different way than you would perceive them. So um, what is actually good performance? Employees may think they have a wonderful performance, but according to maybe your perception of a manager, that might be not the case. So who's right? Um, also, um, managers tend to think easily that all kind of extra tasks are also part of a job, but actually are they? So what is negotiated with employees about what their core tasks are, what are they actually paid for, and what is considered to be extra? Extra would be, in the eyes of the employee, a lot of extra effort, and sometimes in the eyes of the manager, it would be just a normal thing to do. So, again, a source of potential frustration. Um, and also, lesson for manager, try to understand for each and every employee what they come work for. So what is it that they're looking for? And make sure that you not only pay attention to the, the tangible outcomes, so like the salary and the career steps, but also uh, the intangible ones. As a manager, you can make a lot of difference just by recognizing that people also value just a compliment right? uh, to get some recognition for the work they do in words. So a lot of food for thought about how to motivate employees and to keep them on board. There are implications for human resource management. 
Uh, for example, you can think about customizing rewards for employees, so make sure that every employee has a reward package that they find attractive. Well, you can imagine if you have to do that for every single employee, it's going to be really, really expensive and very impractical. But what you could do is think about different groups of employees in your organization and try to make compensation or remuner remuneration packages that are attractive for, uh, for example, uh, students with a side job or, for example, with, for... Uh, for people with families or name it. So you can make, indicate groups in your organization and offer them uh, outcomes that might be valuable to them. Alternatively, you could think of a total reward strategy. So make sure that your uh, package of rewards is competitive. Uh, you know what your competition is doing and offer a, a very broad package of uh, potential rewards within which employees can pick the things that they like the most. That's one thing. Um, the other implication is that you can think about employer branding. Employer brand branding um, involves doing a market research under your employees as well as on the, on the potential employees and try to understand what attracts the employees who currently work in your organization to this organization and communicate that to uh, people who are looking for a job. And that way you can already say, well, this is what this organization has to offer. A lot of people find it really nice, so maybe you are a fit for us as well. Just some examples. Let's move on to the next and final theory of this, um, of this clip, and this is psychological contract theory. As you can see, this theory is a bit newer. It's developed in the 1980s uh, by Denise Rousseau. Um, and Denise Rousseau is diving into the unspoken aspects of the exchange relationship between employers and employees. So in the relationship between employers and employees, a lot more things happen that influence how people feel in organizations than are verbalized, for example, in a written and formal contract. So the key points from the theory is that they, it builds on this idea of the expectancy theory. So people have different expectations uh, and managers and organizations expect uh, returns for that. So, and also these are not always so clear as I just explained in the example what is extra role behavior and what is not. The, the, the word contract resembles to the legal contract that is also defining the work relationship between employees and employers. So in a legal contract, you usually see the, uh, the salary, the work hours, um, maybe some regulations about uh, attendance and maybe some um, uh, information about, uh, about vacation days. But a lot of things are not there. There's, for example, nothing about extra role behavior in a legal contract. And yet it can be assumed that it's there. Neither will, will a legal contract say that you will have nice colleagues, nor will a legal contract say that your manager will be supportive for you, nor will a legal contract say that you will have a promotion in a certain amount of time. So none of these things are in the legal contract, but they do happen in the minds of, the, of employees. And the frustrating thing is that employees can feel that the contract is breached, is violated, uh, by the organization, even if it's still within the framework of the legal contract. And it has all these kinds of withdrawal consequences that we discussed before in the context of fairness. So psychological contract in the definition is, this is about the mutual, the mutual being both the employee and the organization, mutual obligations and expectations of employers and employees and it goes further than the obligations that are stated in the legal contract. To illustrate this in a picture, the legal contract will say something about the type of work and the pay. The psychological contract will contain many of the things that you see in this slide. Just for example, trust, dignity. Many things make up the psychological contract and it's purely in the minds of employees. So this mutual obligations and expectations of employers that go further than the contract as stated in the legal contract, they can be richer or less rich in content. There are transactional contact, contracts, and they, these are 
pretty close to the legal contract. So imagine that you accept a job for three days to do some, you know, some, uh, some construction work in a, in a workplace. You have to, you're just going to help somebody for three days and that's it. And you will have a, uh, you agreed a, an amount of pay for that. Uh, working time thing, you show up, you do your thing, and after three days, it's done. There are minimal additional expectations for such a contract. There still are, so don't underestimate temporary workers' expectations implicitly about their employer. But they are less rich as compared to relational contracts. And relational contracts, they are in the minds of all the employees who have a more open-ended relationship with the, uh, with the organization. Um, they have many implicit expectations about how the organization should behave and about what they should do. So you can, your gut feeling will tell you that it is more easy to violate a relational contract than a transactional contract. So the f final sentence, the psychological contract fulfillment, this is if employees feel that the organization lives up to the expectations, then they will be happy about their jobs, they will be likely to stay, uh, feel satisfied and feel committed to the organization. So there are a load of positive outcomes for employees who are uh, glad with their psycholo psychological contract with the organization. An important thing that we take away from this theory is that uh, breaches of contract lead to violations and these are consequential for the positive outcomes. So um, if an organization does not honor the expectations and obligations that are in the minds of employees, so not on paper, in their minds, they will lead to negative emotions and to withdrawal cognitions and behavior. So they will put less effort to the job and they, they might leave the organization. So where can breaches of contract actually happen? Well, I copied a picture from the from chapter five, where this where you can find this uh, this model as well, um, and you can see that there are different stages in psychological contract formation. So there's pre-entry, recruitment, uh, socialization, as well as later in the uh, in the work. So from the very first contact that an employee has with an organization, expectations start to build about how the company is supposed to behave if they perform in a certain manner. Um, a co a, a communication with somebody in a, uh, in a job fair can already form some, a, a future employee's psychological contract. Same during recruitment, so any contact with, uh, with the selection committee, with talks with, uh, I don't know, future colleagues, this will all create an idea of what the psych psych psychological contract looks, looks like. Later in the career, all these things add up, and if the organization then does not live up to these expectations, then a breach in the contract can happen and people will feel demotivated. So psychological contract formation, the process and the evaluation of it are important in many different uh, aspects of human resource man management. Think, for example, the message you communicate to future workers in employer branding. Think about your recruitment process. Very importantly, think about the first days that people spend at work. Who is going to help them uh, do their way? Do they, do you, are you going to do this in a more structured way so that everybody has the same information or are you just going to let it happen by accident and who knows what people will put in their psychological contracts in these first days? It will happen in performance appraisal. So the moment where you sit with your supervisor and evaluate your, uh, the employee's performance if there are different expectations, employees think that they did quite well and they are receiving, they're expecting a positive evaluation and then the manager has a negative one, imagine what happens. Also, talent management is a risky HR area. So who are the talents in the organization? If you ask employees who are talents, they will say, I am a talent. So there's interesting research uh, asking to organizations who are their talents and then asking to employees, do you think you are a talent to this organization? If you can, as you can imagine, organizations will indicate roughly 20% of their employees as talents and employees themselves, all of them, 
80% of them think that they are a talent to the organization. So talent management programs have a huge risk of violating psychological contracts of at least 60% of employees. So tricky, tricky business. And finally, of course, I mentioned it a few times already, uh, the development of careers is also uh, an important area where people build psychological contracts about. It. So what can you do? So it's important to, uh, to realize that, that this, this happens. It has been extensively researched, especially the consequences of, of breach. Um, and it has implications. So be honest, temper expectations of employees, say what you can promise and say that other, all the other things are maybe not realistic or maybe not at this point realistic, but be, keep communicating. And not just once, not just as em employees enter the organization, but a lot of times. And uh, not just during the performance appraisal interview, which is usually only once a year, but communication between managers and employees on a regular basis is really, really important. Um, you know, in, in, in uh, organization change is also uh, a known example where psychological contracts are violated. So engage employees in organization change processes, inform them as soon as possible and explore together with them what it means to their position, to their expectations and to their feeling about what they should do. So a lot of communication and a lot of real people management needed to manage psychological contracts. So this brings me to the end of this clip. By now you know that uh, uh, fairness is first and foremost equity theory by Alan's, uh, Adams, then it continued with Thibaut and Walker, uh, with organizational justice theories. Uh, we build on the idea that people value different outcomes by introducing expectancy theory, and we ended with how important it is to understand how people build their expectations about the company and about their job, and that if that we shouldn't underestimate how important it is to uh, to keep an eye on potential violations of people's expectations in their psychological contracts. That's it. Thank you.